So fundamentally, the Predator-Prey Project is, is trying to answer what seems to be a, a relatively straightforward question, which is, what are the impacts of wolves and predation in general on various ungulate populations in landscapes with people? But there's a lot more that goes into that than just, you know, a simple who's eating who sort of thing. The Washington Predator-Prey Project was started as a legislative mandate in 2016. Our agency was asked to conduct research looking at the effects of wolf predation on the ungulate populations in Washington state. And we're working together with the University of Washington. They're looking at us. Serving in the legislature, you're only as good as the information that you can get. You know, we've had questions over the years, you know, how are our ungulates doing? You know, what are the populations of moose, elk, deer? People are interested in that in this part of the country. And then we've got some new predators moving in. Well, let's, let's get some good science on it. Initially, it was just sort of, what are the impacts of wolves? And we said, okay, well, we can answer that. But if you really want to know, you can't just leave it at wolves. That's a cat. You have to understand what other carnivores are doing to ungulate populations, and you have to understand uh, how those ungulate populations are competing with one another and how those carnivore populations are competing with one another. And then to make things extra special complicated, you have to incorporate that human element. Wolves in Washington are recolonizing in working landscapes. They're not recolonizing these pristine park-like settings. They're recolonizing areas where people live, where they work, and where they recreate. And so we, we know that we can't take the lessons learned from Yellowstone and apply them here in Washington. We know it's going to be different. With the Predator-Prey Project, there are two study areas. In the Northeast study area, we've got a wolf population that's well established. We're in the Okanagan, they're on what we call the colonizing front. We can then answer questions not just of who's eating who and where and how often, but what's the impact when there's fewer wolves versus more wolves. Right now, we are trying to catch white-tailed deer, uh, specifically using clover traps, which are these big contraptions right here. The goal of this winter field work is to catch white-tailed deer so that we can put GPS tracking collars on them and understand how they're moving around and what their rates and causes of mortality are. Are you guys ready? Get up. Go, go, go. Go, go, go. Drug in. How is she? Whenever we're processing that animal, the main thing is getting the radio collar on it. The other thing we do is we ear tag them, so they each get a unique numbered ear tag. We also take blood samples, and then we actually will check for pregnancy in the field. Is that a heartbeat? These collars check in. We know when that animal is alive. There she goes. But the other side of it is, it notifies us when they die. When the workload picks up for me is when the deer are collared and then we get the occasional mortality and I've got to go out and find it. It's really fun to play detective. You know, when you get in on a site and you've got to really dig in, so to speak, to figure out what the mortality source was. Come 
coming up. Here we go. Hopefully they're below the fog bank here. There's one. Oh yeah. I think that's the that's the collar. I think so. You can probably get on it. Take a look. The whole project is trying to understand how is the return of wolves going to affect deer and elk in the state of Washington? And we want to understand wolf-cougar interactions. Are wolves and cougars using these same areas or not? Are they competing for deer and elk in the same places or not? That is really one of the unanswered questions. Yesterday, you got to check a bunch of empty traps with me, which when you're trying to trap cougars or wolves or anything like that, you do a lot of. You need to make sure that everything is exactly as it should be so that when that opportunity presents itself, you give yourself the greatest chance of, of catching that animal. From the moment I pull the trigger and the dart strikes the cat to when we're done collecting data, it's usually 40 minutes. I usually examine their teeth and measure their teeth because for a carnivore, teeth are everything. Teeth tell you a tremendous amount of information about the condition and the age of the animal. And then we take a, you know, a whole suite of measurements, we weigh them. From there, you give them the reversal and it's on its way and doing its part for science. In the most simple sense, GPS collars tell us where wolves and cougars are eating food. We'll see a bunch of locations in the same spot, which we call a cluster and either the animal's resting there or they've stopped to eat something. We'll hike out to the center of those points and we can actually find out if that was indeed a feeding site versus a bed site and what was eaten. What was the species, age, and sex of that, that food item? Camera trapping seems like it would be easy, but we randomly pick locations across the landscape, which can be miles and miles and miles off trail up on top of a giant mountain. And then you can spend literally hours trying to get the camera set up just right so that it's gonna trigger on anything from, you know, a bobcat to a moose. A really powerful thing that the camera traps bring to this project that maybe the GPS callers can't is that the cameras are monitoring, you know, one spot for a long period of time. You'll get pictures of every single animal that comes to that spot. This is card number C76. So the data that we're collecting comes in all forms, so we're getting fine scale location data of each individual animal, which can be hundreds of thousands of points on the landscape. We're also collecting data about each individual's life history. So how old is this individual? Did this animal die? What was the cause of mortality? Is it predation or is it roadkill or is it disease? So 
All this information that we collect goes into models, basically, that form an idea of what is actually influencing the population as a whole. To me, the predator-prey project matters because it's more information so I can do my job better. You know, I'm tasked with managing the wildlife, specifically in District 1, for the people of the state of Washington. Most people I talk to are not only willing to let me put a camera on their property, but really excited about it. And I think it's a really cool component of this project that we're getting to know so many people in these communities and seeing how invested they are in the landscape, in the animals, and then in the management and conservation of those things. That's, I think, the biggest thing you can come out of this is balance between predators and prey and also with the people that live here. And there's a balance that can be found. We just haven't got there yet. And I'm hopeful, guardedly hopeful, but hopeful. I mean, ultimately, that's who this information goes to in the end, is it goes to the public. We manage and conserve wildlife and trust for them, right? And so that's our ultimate obligation, is to do the best science we possibly can to get the best information we possibly can to really make sure that both people and wildlife thrive into the future.